It's Monday. It's February 12th. And the word of the day is apostatize, which means to abandon firmly held principles upon realizing they're wrong. Used in a sentence, the antonym of apostatize is to internet, the verb. You know, I was absolutely 100% certain that word meant something else, but um, I stand corrected. (laughs) <laughs> I'm Michael Marshall. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America and across the pond, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, we unveil some horrifying Groundhog Day lore. We find out just how popular the popular conservatives are. And Twitter deals with Russian misinformation for the very first time. But first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, Michael Marshall and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, happy almost Valentine's Day. You have any romantic advice for a newly engaged person? I mean, she agreed to marry you, so the playbook's kind of out the window, you know? I don't really... Sure. Yeah, Yeah, but um, I'd say be more British, um, suppress your feelings, maintain a stoic exterior, and just hope she picks things up from subtle context clues. So um, business as usual, Heath, essentially. (laughs) Yeah, check, 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 or however many that was. (laughs) All right. In our lead story tonight, in Tuck Your Face News, Tucker Carlson continued with his new job called... What if I interviewed blank, right? Right? So edgy if I did that. The show. That's his show. (laughs) Ever since being fired by Fox News, when Fox News had to distance itself ethically from Tucker Carlson, he's been producing his own show. He gets deeply problematic people to speak with him, and he asks them probing questions. Not at all. He doesn't do that at all. In fairness, that works really well for Joe Rogan, so that's the format for Tucker as well. And Tucker's latest guest was murderous dictator Vladimir Putin. Okay, now I'm picturing Vladimir Putin like smoking a joint with Joe Rogan while Jamie Googles if he did in fact declare dibs on Crimea. So (laughs) that image is in my head. Yeah, that was about what happened. So one of the major critiques of Tucker is that maybe it's a bad idea to give a platform to a real-life Bond villain, for example. Oh, so you're in favor of no platforming, or uh, mm. Dr. No platforming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sort of. I mean, that being said, I do think it's a good idea to have Putin doing an interview with a journalist. Unfortunately, we got Tucker Carlson instead. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> so we got two straight hours of pseudo-history, ridiculous propaganda, and very obvious lying. And Tucker offers no pushback whatsoever. It's like the opposite of be reasonable. Right, yeah. What would you say to people who accuse you of invading (laughs) Ukraine? Oh, you'd say Ukraine was actually Russia's all along. Well, that's good enough for me. No further questions. (laughs) Not a single mm was uttered. Interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Tucker's just licking boots for two hours. If I had to describe Tucker's energy... I'd say um, it's that sidekick from the Cobra Kai dojo who's just laughing along at Johnny Lawrence, sweeping the leg, being like, put him in a body bag. Yeah. (laughs) Tucker just smiles like an idiot the whole time. I get it. You worked with someone remotely for so long and then you're finally hanging out in person. It's the pajama party for him. I get it. Yeah, exactly. This is Tucker's (laughs) matron pajama party, except his wife didn't fall ill, which is weird because that does usually happen to journalists around Putin. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Yeah. So Putin started the interview with a good 30 minutes of really old Russian history. And it was all leading up to his claim that Ukraine doesn't really exist like as a nation. Putin's wrong about that. I've seen it. I've done seen that nation. <laughs> yeah, it's there. It's there. It's a, it's a country. But yeah, despite Putin making that exact same claim in a 2021 essay and then getting debunked by a long list of historians from Russia, from Ukraine, from all over the world, Tucker just sat there just agreeing, trying to nod along in agreement like he understood what was happening. But Of course, Tucker's a dumb person, so he kept nodding at the wrong times. (laughs) And Putin almost stops to be like, Okay, if you if you don't know when to not, just just sit there. Don't don't do anything. Sorry, I just I didn't realize the role of yes man would be so demanding. I really (laughs) kind of thought it was just the one job. (laughs) So from there 
Putin started talking about the invasion of Ukraine. Here's the story from Vlad. The whole invasion was actually George W. Bush's fault. And that was a really smart way to start because that sounds very plausible to me. I know, right? Right? Yeah, the claim that anything since 2001 is George W. Bush's fault passes the smell test for me, for sure. Feels (laughs) solid. Yeah, so Putin, or Putty Poot, as George W. likes to call him, he explained that Bush announced in 2008 that Ukraine might become a member of NATO, which is true, but also doesn't justify invading a country. Nothing from Tucker on that. So Putin continued and claimed that in 2014, the CIA engineered a coup in Ukraine that put neo-Nazis into power. And again, that sounds like exactly the type of thing the CIA would do. But in reality, this was not one of the many times the CIA definitely did something like that. And like Tucker didn't push back on that, but because that would mean criticizing neo Nazis, and you never turn on your own fans and your own funders. Exactly. You know? yes. That'd be like this show coming out swinging for people who sometimes feel awkward in social situations. You know, it's business suicide. You don't do it. <laughs> you know what looks bad? Goatee and a bald head. We're just not going <laughs> yeah. there. We're not going okay. there. The best part of this is that Putin had to repeat the bullshit that his Twitter bots have been making up for the last two years. It's like if J.K. Yep. Rowling was forced to do Slughorn McGonagall fan fiction erotica for all her public readings of Harry Potter from now on. So here's what actually happened in 2014. And Tucker could have learned this with a casual Google. Ukraine's president at the time, Viktor Yanukovych, decided to back away from NATO and the EU. And when he did that, it led to a big rebellion. Yanukovych tried to suppress that rebellion with gunfire, but it didn't work. And he fled to Russia while a pro-NATO government took over in Kiev. And the reason Yanukovych backed away from NATO is because his government got paid about $17 billion by Vladimir Putin to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Also, quick reminder for those of you who might not know the whole history here, the reason Putin doesn't want countries near Russia to join NATO is that NATO is there to prevent illegal invasions of other (laughs) small countries, a a problem Putin has made consistently worse by his illegal invasion of Ukraine. (laughs) Uh, So Putin gave us another obvious lie when he claimed that he's always been all about a peaceful resolution. He said, almost exact quote, you remember when I removed all my troops from from Kiev as a friendly gesture, right after we lost that battle, we wanted (laughs) to turn around and go back. For peace, you're welcome. He also explained how the breakdown of the peace talks was actually Boris Johnson's fault for convincing Zelensky to keep fighting despite the amazing deal that was on the table. And again, That sounds very plausible, but it turns out that was not one of the many terrible ideas from Boris Johnson. There was no amazing deal on the table. Putin was making an offer called, you surrender now, please. Yeah, I mean, look, if we've learned anything this year, it's that the only thing Boris Johnson ever really convinced anyone of doing was violating COVID protocols. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, given that Boris Johnson's Wikipedia page can't decide if he has eight or nine children, it's fair to say he's able to convince some of the people to do a few other things. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so lots of lying, lots of propaganda, but here's my biggest gripe about the whole thing. Putin's been doing polonium stuff for years like it's a hobby Mm. but the one time we're all going to be cool with it and he's doing the world a favor he lets it go come on thank you (laughs) but i guess you don't mess with your idiot puppet hype man in the american media strategy wise and speaking of polonium murder (laughs) quick quick, (laughs) sure they're gonna word from our sponsor policy genius Okay, I see. And what about polio? Is that covered? You've got to check. Yeah, yeah, no, I can hold. Hey, Marsh, what you doing there? Oh, uh, Marsh and Nicola are coming to the pajama party this year, so he's making sure his travel insurance covers any and all childhood diseases we might accidentally give her. Sure. Okay, I see. And um, what about milk leg? Yeah, no, I can hold again, yeah. Okay, I don't know. Is this really necessary? I mean, look, it might not be fun to talk about, but insurance is a great way to take care of yourself and your loved ones. That's why I got life insurance with Policy Genius. Oh, what's Policy Genius? Great, great. Glad to hear it. Um, what about scarlet fever? Oh, and, um, and yellow fever. Well, 
pretty much all the fevers, actually. Policy Genius's technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. Even if you already have a life insurance policy through work, it might not offer enough protection for your family's needs, and it might not follow you if you leave your job. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius has licensed, award winning agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. And they work for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have any incentive to recommend one insurer over another, so you can trust their guidance. All right, that sounds great. Where do I sign up? Save time and money and provide your family with a financial safety net using Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com. Okay, thanks, Eli. Okay, um, last of all, do you do you cover prank wars? Um, Eli who? No, no, sorry, I don't know anyone by that name. <sighs> right, no, yes, I understand. <sighs> God damn it, that's the third one today. You gotta stop asking about the prank wars, Marsh. Yeah, that's on you. And we're back. And next up in headlines, in God Save the King news... In an unexpected announcement from Buckingham Palace, we learned this week that King Prince Charles has cancer. A malignant parasite that's a drain on the energy and resources from everything around it, Charles has been on the throne for just over a year, and now he has cancer. Uh, It's typical, really. You wait seven decades for a dying monarch, and then two come along at once. Yeah, and he can't cure himself by eating a baby, thanks to Tim... Ballard, the hero, and QAnon. Yeah. <laughs> I also really enjoy that they won't tell us what kind of cancer he has, right? Like like mentioning that the king's liver is a weak point might open him up for further intrusion. <laughs> I mean, and so if you think this all seems a bit callous of me, to be making light of the ill health of a famous septuagenarian, um, firstly, blame me light. He's a bad influence, obviously. Um, sure. But also... This could arguably be seen as like a preemptive strike against my country inevitably losing its mind again because sure royal will. ill health just has this weird effect on the people of the UK and we've only just managed to disperse the 50 mile queue that formed to view the queen's coffin. <laughs> Okay, look, your country might have an unhealthy obsession with 70-year-old leaders, but at least you don't keep electing them, Marsh, all right? At least you didn't choose. We might do 81 this year if we're lucky. He's fine. You have to vote for him. He's fine. Who cares? You have to do it. American politics. I'm not interested. You have to do it. (laughs) You do, though. So... Already, we've seen this country acting in just completely deranged ways. The BBC ran a rolling live blog of the king's cancer which which only stopped like just so short weird. of updating on each individual act of mitosis within the tumor it was that detailed <laughs> and th- they did give us like a handy king prince charles cancer qr code that we could scan to stay up to they date really did <laughs> yeah yeah they're also setting up a facebook app it's called um meta static <laughs> <laughs> fantastic boo <laughs> boo heath and right then sorry, was... sorry, you want to do a jape, Eli? You want to, like, hit me in the crotch with a wiffle ball bat <laughs> more, or something? I'm more of a character guy. <laughs> <laughs> then there was the cartoon which went viral, which lovingly depicted Charles walking hand in hand with Paddington the bear, with the bear, like, promising he'd look after him. Um, and Paddington, for those who are wondering, has somehow become associated with the deaths of significant elderly establishment British people for reasons that would just be inexplicable were I even beginning to explain it. But take my word for it, right? Here we are. A fictional marmalade-guzzling bear from Peru is the official grim reaper of the English (laughs) upper classes. I think it's kind of nice that you guys have him deliver the decisions of your death panels. But, you know, who am I to judge? You know, I'm not running those. Um, The other reason that I might be taking this a little bit more lightly than you might expect is that King Prince Charles is the person we're talking about here. This is a man who has for decades pushed alternative medicine as the cure for whatever ails you, including cancer. Because he tried to get the NHS to explore supporting Gerson therapy, which is a treatment I've dedicated years of my life to exposing and protecting people from. He was, he was part of the reason that the NHS took so long to stop spending precious resources on homeopathy because he was trying to keep it on. Um, he's also unequivocally just a net drag on the health of the UK. And I'm not saying that we should, like, 
do the maths before we decide which side to back here. But I'm also like not not saying that. <laughs> right. And we should point out that now that he's actually got cancer, fucking Paddington is making with the chemo and the surgery <laughs> rather than the titrating some marmalade with essence of being way too fucking old. <laughs> okay. Somebody please make the cartoon of Paddington Bear giving King Prince Charles a coffee enema. Please do that. <laughs> and it already exists. I don't know how to draw it. Yeah. They found it. It's online. So given King Prince Charles's public advocacy for bullshit, people have reasonably wondered whether he'll be using homeopathy for his cancer treatment. And, and I actually, I think that's probably unlikely, not because he knows better, but because he's one of the richest and most privileged men in the entire country with access to the very best private healthcare our money can buy him. Um, and his, his advisors around him will be pretty insistent that he gets like the actual medicine this time. Okay, but you know he's got like a secret butler modeling a little bit of tumor into his Earl Grey to make homeopathic <laughs> cancer or whatever. No So question. like, what's going to yeah, happen sure. is he's going to take the stuff that works and then he'll also take some stuff that doesn't work. And if he survives, we can be pretty sure which one of those two he's going to give the credit to. Okay, Marsh, I do think you're being too harsh there. The monarchy would never credit anyone for anything good that happened to them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but still, like, there's there's one more wrinkle to this story, right? Because King Prince Charles has another advisor in the mix here. Because as king, he has to appoint a head of the royal medical household. And the person that he chose for that position was Dr. Michael Dixon. And Dixon, it turns out, is a huge advocate for homeopathy, as was reported in The Guardian in December 2023. Oh, and, and uh, as was also reported in my magazine, The Skeptic, six months earlier in May 2023. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So not only is he dying of bullshit, which he'll secretly call Baxi's on, but before he does, he's going to declare RFK Jr. the new Surgeon General. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I am looking forward to Elton John writing Ear Candle in the Wind or whatever. When <laughs> there it is. And like Michael Dixon is such an ow. Ad- <laughs> and Michael Dixon is such an advocate for homeopathy that when he was appointed, Buckingham Palace had to put out a statement saying, Dr. Dixon does not believe homeopathy can cure cancer. Not great. But, lo and behold, a few <laughs> months later, Charles is found to have cancer. Now, I'm not saying that there's a link here and that appointing a homeopath to be your doctor gives you cancer. Right. I'm not saying that because that would confuse correlation with causation. <laughs> However, I'm saying the homeopaths should be saying that because confusing <laughs> correlation with causation is literally their whole thing. That's all they've exactly. got. Exactly. Yeah. Stay on brand. <laughs> and in infiltration news, I'll admit this next story probably isn't news to most of our American listeners. But when we're graced with Michael Marsh's presence, I feel like we owe it to ourselves and each other to give our special guest a sneak peek, if you will, into the American hellscape. And since there are only so many stories about bathroom bills and immigration vigilantes we can do before Marsh stops coming to the pajama party, this week we're going to talk about a yearly American tradition that comes across my desk and I realize I had to share it. I'm talking, of course, about the fair weather scrying of a rodent in Pennsylvania. <laughs> For those unfamiliar, which I hope includes our dear Marsh, I'm talking about the Amerocentric Groundhog Day, a holiday that first gets a mention in our nation's history all the way in 1840. Though, being English, I'm pretty sure Marsh can reach out and touch something older than 1840 without being off microphone. 1840. Okay, well, there's a building like at the end of my street that got renamed the Ancient Chapel of Toxteth in 1830 um it was built in 1618 <laughs> but it's it's new nickname is older than groundhog day that you yeah, like i said like i said nice. it's not a not a fair fight anyway uh marsh if you're not familiar once a year punxsutawney phil an immortal groundhog is let out of his home where he observes how light affects his body and then depending on whether or not he sees his shadow there will be six more weeks of winter though wikipedia does helpfully point out in their entry on groundhog's day that there is in fact no causation between the translated musings of a groundhog and the actual <laughs> weather results <laughs> that being said phil came out this year and said hey have you guys been spewing carbon into the air like yesterday was super hot today there's a bomb cyclone blizzard so <laughs> Yeah, it felt pretty accurate from Phil. 
<laughs> but it's it's about whether he sees his shadow. Like, how do they know whether he sees his shadow or not? Does he start like doing <laughs> shadow puppets or something? Like, oh, this one's a little bunny rabbit. It's kind of hard to do without thumbs, yeah. but like, this one's a bunny rabbit. <laughs> Now, a lot of you are out there thinking, okay, Eli, we all know this stuff. Why are you bringing it up? Well, aside from bringing you the good news that Phil did not, in fact, see his shadow this year, and so climate change is still real, uh, there's a little piece of mythos that I learned from the official website of the Punxsutawney Groundhog Club this year on their (laughs) FAQ page. These are the exact quotes from the official website. I am changing nothing. Question. How many fills have there been over the years? Answer. There has only been one Punxsutawney Phil. He has been making predictions since 1886. Punxsutawney Phil gets his longevity from drinking the elixir of life, a secret recipe. (laughs) Phil takes one sip every summer at the groundhog picnic, and it magically gives him seven more years of life. Seven? So he's good for like 966 more years now. They're wasting the elixir. (laughs) But, like, in Punxsutawney, they've discovered the secret to eternal life. Is it one of those, like, cursed genie things where you do get to live forever, but you also have to live in Pennsylvania? So, like, most people just decline it. (laughs) Yeah, no. Not worth it. Question. Does Phil have any children? Answer. No. Phil has never had any children. Cool. Probably shows up for records on time. Okay. (laughs) Question. Does Phil have a wife? Answer. Again, I have changed nothing. Yes. Her name is Phyllis. Love she that. doesn't receive the elixir of life. What? what? So she will not live forever like Phil. End quote <laughs> from the website. <laughs> Why would you include that in your myth, let alone oh your God. FAQ page? This raises so many more questions than it answers. I looked at it like groundhogs live for an average of three years in the wild. So does Phil lose his wife every three years? And then he, he takes a new bride and what? ritualistically renames her Phyllis every three years for the last 140 (laughs) years. Why do we care about him seeing his shadow, like that part of the story, and not this like endless quest for replacement wife? Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, the Bluebeard myth is based on Punxsutawney Phil. Anyways, (laughs) I hope our foreign correspondent appreciates this brief but horrifying view into American culture, and I hope that Phil like the 2014 short-lived TV series Forever, finds the weapon that first killed him so that he can finally rest. (laughs) And speaking of wanting to die, time to toss to our second sponsor this week, BetterHelp. (laughs) This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Flowers? No. Hmm. Uh, Chocolates? Ah. I already got them. Hey, Heath, uh, what are you doing? Yeah, what's the hubbub? Oh, hey, guys. I'm just trying to figure out what to get myself for Valentine's Day. Sorry, yourself? Yeah, your relationship with yourself is incredibly important. That's why I get my therapy with BetterHelp. Wait, what's online therapy from BetterHelp? If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So if I need therapy that's queer affirming or secular and I might live in places where it's hard to find those things, they can help me find someone? They sure can. All right, Heath, we're sold. Where do we sign up? Become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Skeptocrat. All right, Heath, thanks. Okay, so uh, what do you guys think of this? Uh, the outfit? It's um, revealing. Right? Sort of send the right message, you know what I'm saying? To, to yourself? Yes, Marsh. Pay attention to myself. Got it? Okay. And we're back. Next up in headlines, in Don't Whip Count Your Chickens news... House Republicans got foiled by the numerical nature of numbers last week, and it was so much fun to watch. The GOP plan was to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas because they think the Constitution says you have to maim immigrants with razor wire if we say that. Side note, no, you don't. That's not what it says. Right. It doesn't say that now, but it feels like that joke might age badly if Trump does win in November. 
Because I think the only reason he didn't introduce an amendment in his first term is that none of his advisors told him the Constitution existed, so he just didn't know about it. I don't talk about the future. Don't put <laughs> stuff in ether, Marsh. So <laughs> in order to get an impeachment, you need just barely a majority of the House to approve it. And with four vacancies and one absence, the House of normally 435 had 430 possible votes that day. Sorry, okay, no, I'm moving too fast. A majority means more than half. So you have to divide by two and then add one. That means 216 votes if we have any Republicans listening. And that's how many votes we got against the impeachment. The final tally was 216 to 214 against. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson was... Very confused. I mean, to be honest, I'm with him at this point. I'm surprised everyone has kept track of which political party they started with over the last couple of years. Yeah, so here's how it's supposed to work when one party has a majority in the House, as the Republicans currently do. There's a term I mentioned at the top called the whip count. Maybe rename that political body with way too many white ones. (laughs) Sure, sure. In this case, that refers to one of the GOP House members known as the majority whip. That too. And also renamed yeah, that. Yeah, that too. He checks with the team to make sure they have enough Republican votes. That guy is Tom Emmer right now, although he might be fired any minute. So the whip count is just count, and the Republicans <laughs> did it wrong. But they did get fooled by a delightful ruse. Democrat Al Green had been absent for all the earlier votes that day for medical reasons. And it appears the GOP assumed he'd missed the impeachment vote in the evening. So they figured it was actually 429 total votes, and therefore they only needed 215. But then the hero that Gotham deserves, Al Green, showed up at the last minute immediately after getting intestinal surgery, still wearing scrubs, and cast the vote that killed the impeachment. Hey, everybody. Yep, no, good to see you. Let me just set up my IV bag here and fuck your face. Fuck your face. <laughs> yep, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the Republicans had three defectors who voted against. Two of them were very clear ahead of time about how this whole impeachment thing is fucking stupid, which it is. But the final defector, Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin, was unexpected by the Republicans. So the tally landed just short of what they needed, And that's when the entire GOP leadership squad sprinted over to Mike Gallagher in a panic and had a very long animated whisper fight with a whole bunch of arm motions. And then, with time running out, Marjorie Taylor Greene came over and started just screaming at him like a crazy person. And Mike Gallagher just sat there with his arms folded, not saying a word. Okay, not to part the curtain too much, but I just realized in hearing that story that I am the Marjorie Taylor Greene of Puzzle in a Thunderstorm LLC. And I'd just like to take this moment to apologize to Noah and Heath publicly for (laughs) all the times. So once the vote was officially over, we got to watch a whole bunch of Republicans be in a big snit after that giant embarrassment. Ralph Norman of South Carolina said... Really would have thought we'd know the count. Is it that hard? Yeah, but as a Republican from South Carolina, I assume he's just genuinely asking how hard it is to count up to 215 because he's never managed to get that hard. (laughs) (laughs) We also heard from MTG, who was still definitely working out the math riddle in her head as she gave a statement. She said, quote, they hid one of their members. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Waiting till the last minute, watching to see our votes, trying to throw us off on the numbers that we had versus the numbers that they had. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a strategy in play tonight. <laughs> End quote. Uh, hit him. Lady, he was in bright blue scrubs. <laughs> <laughs> so just to be clear, if you're keeping score at home, the vote landed at 215 each just short of the majority needed by the GOP to get the impeachment. But then one Republican switched his vote at the end because of a technicality. For some reason, the tie would mean the matter's closed. But with the GOP losing by two votes, it's now possible for Mike Johnson to call for another vote. No idea why that's the case, but it is. Yeah, greatest democracy in the world, ladies and gentlemen, right there. (laughs) (laughs) So next to that weird technicality, Johnson scheduled the do-over vote for Tuesday, for tomorrow if you're listening when this comes out. And the timing is no coincidence. The special election in New York to fill the seat that was involuntarily vacated by George Santos is also on Tuesday, 
with Democrat Tom Swazi having a slight edge in the latest polls Swazi, over Republican Swazi, Mazi Swazi. Yeah, indeed. And speaking of George Santos, right after the GOP missed by one vote, Santos tweeted, miss me yet? Along with a photo of the vote tally. <laughs> uh, George, I'm pretty sure of the many, many regrets the Republican Party is dealing with right now. Getting rid of you is not one of them. Okay, they're not. <laughs> Might they're be not a little bit, you. but yeah, in the grand scheme, no. So we'll see how it goes this week. But regardless, here's the bottom line. Even if Republicans do learn to count and Republican Steve Scalise comes back from his absence to tip the scales in the House vote, the Senate still has to vote to convict, which they won't. And even if the Senate accidentally did vote to convict, because, you know, numbers are hard, Joe Biden would just appoint somebody else named like Shmalashmandro Shmayorkas, and the Senate would approve that person or approve somebody who did not officially change their name for an awesome bit. Either way... <laughs> This is nothing. It's this is nothing. nothing is true. It's it's just a warm up to try to maybe impeach Biden is what they're doing. They're trying to like work out the bugs, one of which is apparently counting numbers. <laughs> so. I mean, the Hunter stuff is going so well for him, right? I mean, we are <laughs> we are embarrassed. Let me tell you that has that process has really shown us <laughs> how foolish we are. And in fetch the popcorn news. Fantastic. If <laughs> I didn't get it until you used your accent. Now I understand. And gotcha. <laughs> uh, if there's one thing that Hollywood has made clear, it's that we all love a good comeback story. There's always that bit in the middle, in the in the middle of the blockbuster, where all the hope is lost, the the hero looks defeated, things look bleakest, only for everything to turn around in spectacular fashion. Well, I'm not the only one to have spent way too much time contemplating cinematic midpoints, because this week we got to see the triumphant return of the political hero that everyone's been crying out for, Liz Truss. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like if Paulie had ended up defeating Apollo Creed. Here we go. <laughs> so um, for those who can't remember Liz Truss, don't worry. I don't blame you. But she was actually our prime minister for like the whole of September 2022 and even some of October as well. <laughs> Um, huh. If you need a quick reminder of who she is, you can head over to her Wikipedia page and you'll find a section about her time as Prime Minister, which opens with the subheading Death of Elizabeth II, <laughs> then followed by the subheading <laughs> Mini Budget, concluded by the subheading Government Crisis and Resignation. <laughs> and honestly, those 10 words are the only words her political biography needs to contain. I just want those 10 words and then the rest of the, bo the book is just glamour shots of the letters that outlasted her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just cut to Eli in his bat cave. Anna, did you throw out my lettuce armor? I knew I was going to need it again for bits. <laughs> Still, you cannot keep a Tory down. And, and so Truss is back and she's fronting a new faction within the Conservative Party called Popular Conservatism. Go fuck yourself. Because nothing screams popular like appointed prime minister by a room full of old rich white guys and then ousted <laughs> before the salad went limp. Well, she was going to go with the oxymoron party, but the Tories were going to sue her for copyright infringement because of the morons. So, you know, it was, it was tough. It was tough. <laughs> At least just be honest and be like, it's the white party. We're the whites. Like the whites of the round table or whatever. Just be <laughs> honest is what I'm saying. So the Popular Conservatism Faction, or PopCon for short, uh, they held their launch event last week. And you shouldn't confuse them with the National Conservatives Faction, or Nazis for short, um, who <laughs> they called that, they are called that. They had their launch event last May. And neither of those should be confused with the other genuine named factions within the Tory party, which include the European Research Group, the Northern Research Group, the Net Zero Scrutiny Group, the Common Sense Group, and the One Nation Conservatives, the latter of whose founding principle is the belief that the nation can get united behind the Tory party, if only the Tory party could first get united behind themselves, I guess. Sure. <laughs> yeah, honestly, a splinter cell in the name of unity. That's your first mistake <laughs> right there, guys. I don't know if you're taking notes, but... Okay, how does the rich conservative populism scam keep working mm. like in the u.s we have stupid shit like country music and guns and truck nuts to mask it is there a uk version of that stuff i can't picture it is that yeah it's, it's cigarettes and it's real ale in those pint pots that have got like dimples <laughs> on the side and it's that's basically what? it that's the whole thing are the wokes trying to ban real ale yeah, well, yeah, basically, yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, we're conservatives Pints. in your country. I'm a Tory. You should on, not I'm invite us to now. QED this year because we're getting weird. <laughs> we're getting weird. 
Anyway, speaking as I was of being united, that brings us back to the PopCons. Um, they had four Conservative MPs scheduled to speak at their launch event last week. Um, they were scheduled right until the night before the event when this new faction uh, bifurcated, I guess, <laughs> with MPs Ranil Jayawardena and Simon Clark pulling out of the event and criticising the group and going their own way. Amazing. And honestly, the Tory party at this point isn't so much factional as it is fractal. Who's the snowflakes now, assholes? <laughs> so, so that's who's split from the popcorn. So who was actually left to speak at the launch event? Um, well, we had Liz Truss herself, obviously. She urged the Tory party to take on the, quote, left-wing extremists who are, quote, running UK institutions. Um, quick reminder, her party has been in charge of this country since 2010, which makes this government older than Spotify and Uber. Yeah, <laughs> and much like Spotify and Uber, the British government is not working like it used to, but rich people in charge of it are pretty sure that if you pay for stuff that used to be free, it'll be good again. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Trust went on to clarify what she meant by extreme left wing, which she says includes environmentalists and those who are in favour of supporting LGBT people or ethnic minorities. Um, and to be fair, she's absolutely right, because if you look around modern Britain, the overriding impression you get is there's just too much support for ethnic minorities going on right now. I've heard that, yeah. Like, I heard there's even like a bunch of brown people who've been given free flights to holiday destinations like Rwanda for no Nothing, nothing what? at all. And we know some of those brown people are gay because that's the reason they fled their home countries in the first place. So it's 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 wokeness gone mad. It really sure. is. Yeah. Hey, maybe go back to the full on monarchy. Just Ooh. like, I don't know, for a year to see what happens. I feel like it's not going to be worse. Mm. Right. I don't know if conservatives are going for this bullshit populist thing. Maybe liberals need to go for ending democracy like confuse them right back i don't know i don't know what to do do you really Not want to this. give king prince charles all that extra workload the man's unwell heath that's cruel <laughs> I do. Uh, popcorn it also featured a speech from uh, lee anderson the ashfield mp who used his time to argue against net zero by telling audiences quote i'm an ex-coal miner and i'm one of those people that want to see our pits open i want to see us frack I'm pretty sure that coal a hundred million years ago was trees and plants. Well, I would argue that's sustainable, unquote. What? Wow. Okay, lots to unpack there. First and foremost, the way he introduces himself, not like it's his former profession, but like he's been clean from coal since he OD'd on it in 97. <laughs> Hit rock bottom in that pit, yeah. What do you think he's picturing when he says 100 million like as compared to one in his head, like a fun size candy bar versus the full size for scale. <laughs> uh, well, Lee Anderson, if we're talking about what things used to be, um, why don't we talk about how literally just a month ago you used to be the chair of the Conservative Party, but you quit that really important role in order to vote against Rishi Sunak's Rwanda bill? Because Anderson was one of those Tories that I mentioned on the last episode who argued that the Rwanda bill wasn't inhumane enough and so he was going to vote against it. But when it came to voting, he walked at the voting chamber to cast his vote and some MPs from the other parties were laughing at him. So he walked out and abstained instead. Really? Which meant, yeah, yeah, he quit his leadership role on a point of principle and then immediately <laughs> abandoned that principle because some of the other boys <laughs> made fun of him. <laughs> okay, 100% his mom called their moms later that day. It was a whole thing. <laughs> So, I mean, I'm I'm sure you'll all join me in wishing PopCon, like, absolutely all the best. And, and I, I do mean that, honestly, because I'm a big fan of what they're trying to do, which is to divide the Tory party up into something smaller. Um, and if anything, I, wanted there, I want there to be even more factions within the Conservative Party. So they just get, like, smaller and smaller and smaller until they just disappear. Love it. And if the latest polls are anything to go by, the Tories are, like, currently predicted to win just 20% of seats across the country, we might actually get that wish. And honestly, like, a Conservative Party with so few seats may honestly be the most popular Conservative Party possible. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and in snow contest news, it's an election year, and the importance of your vote is perhaps no better illustrated than this next story. Because when you get lazy, when you let your guard down, terrible political tragedies happen. I'm talking, of course, about the results of this year's Minnesota snowplow naming contest. 
<laughs> the Illuminati controls all the snow banks. Yes, we need to storm the Capitol building in St. Paul. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it, it's a conspiracy by the Blizzard people. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Started by the Minnesota <laughs> Department of... Yeah, you go. He got it. He got he, it. He, he was there. Started by the Minnesota Department of Transportation in 2020, the contest began as a way to cheer people up during the COVID-19 pandemic. According to a spokesperson from the organization, this proud tradition has carried forward some of the most punerific names ever seen by the state. But this year, in a terrible upset, the solutions were deeply lacking. Among fantastic entries like Can't Snow Me Down, Beyond Slay, and You're Killing Me Squalls, the overwhelming <laughs> winner with nearly double the votes was Taylor Drift, which doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> yeah, Beyond Slay was great. I'm fucking furious about this. I almost hired Kanye to interrupt the award for Taylor Drift. <laughs> yeah, and he's short on money. You think Beyond Slay was robbed? My entry wasn't even allowed on the ballot. Apparently, White Plower has racially threatening overtones. <laughs> the whole thing's a fix. Exactly. So, yeah, we're obviously pretty upset here at The Skeptocrat. Uh, we're taking puns pretty seriously. And so let this story serve as a reminder to you, podcast listener, however little you might feel your vote matters, whatever personal gripes you have against Joe Biden or the Democratic Party, you have a moral obligation to vote for the people who can and will beat Donald Trump, lest our country suffer the same fate as oh for sleet's sake and don't flurry be happy. And finally tonight, in Lawrence and the Yas Queen news, that's, that's tenuous, it is tenuous. Um, the, <laughs> the former actor, former candidate for mayor of London and former contender for most of all dad of all time, Lawrence Fox, got a lesson in free speech last week when a high court ruled that it is not libelous to call Lawrence Fox a racist. Go on, Marsh. You're an American podcast now. You want to get a few out there? You've earned this, buddy. Go on. <laughs> so, like, the backstory here almost <laughs> isn't needed because, like, if a judge had, apropos of nothing, issued a statement saying it's totally fine to call Lawrence Fox a racist, none of us would have batted an eyelid. That's a reasonable thing for a judge to come out and say. But the backstory is genuinely fun, so we're going to go there anyway. So back in October 2020, a supermarket posted on Twitter to say they were taking a stance against racism towards their black employees um, as part of their support for Black History Month. And that apparently upset free speech advocate Lawrence Fox, who I guess just really wanted to use his nectar points to buy clan robes or something, I don't know. And, and now he couldn't because of what he saw as promoting racial segregation and discrimination. So in response, people pointed out that Fox was kind of sounding like a bit of a racist there. And three of those people were the Stonewall trustee, Simon Blake, the former RuPaul's Drag Race contestant, Crystal, and the actress and activist, Nicola Thorpe. Um, side note, that's not my wife. That's a different lady with a very huh. similar sounding name and very close. a very similar opinion on how much of a racist Lawrence Fox is. Sure. Yeah, but it's a great loophole if Nicola ever asks him about his celebrity list, right? You can be like, oh, <laughs> thank you. No, baby, it's just you and Ronnie O'Sullivan, like I always say. <laughs> so Lawrence Fox isn't the kind of man to take being called a racist lying down. And he immediately shot back with laser-like precision to call those three people pedophiles. Unclear why. Um, I mean, I guess he just felt he had too much money since his ex-wife refused to accept child maintenance payments in Bitcoin. I guess that's the only reason he did it. So they sued him for libel and he countersued for calling him a racist. And the whole thing ended up at the high court. And during the case, Lawrence Fox explained how the tweets calling him a racist caused his acting jobs to dry up and destroyed his reputation, which is obviously nonsense because, if anything, it cemented his reputation as a racist. Yeah, yeah. plenty of acting jobs at the Daily Wire if you're a racist. Great place to go when your acting jobs dry up. That's actually their slogan. So. Yeah, that's what they send you in their Owned casting. By I, I just have to point this out. For those who don't know, Lawrence's last listed role on IMDb is Hunter Biden. Biden in the anti-Biden drama mentary, My Son Hunter. So look, I mean, uh -huh. Lawrence, if I were you, I'd be begging people to end my career. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, last week, a high court judge ruled that it was wrong for Fox to call those people pedophiles. End of ruling. So like, it wasn't defamatory for them to call him a racist, according to the high court. And that has got to sting, right? 
Because as Nicola Thorpe tweeted after the ruling, given that foxes told a black man to fuck off back to Jamaica, posted pride flags in the shape of a swastika, and shared blacked up images of himself, yeah, it sure did. it's time that Mr. Fox accepted that any damage done to his reputation is entirely his own doing. <laughs> So hats off to Simon Clark and for Nicola Thorpe for seeing this through and refusing to be bullied. But a special hats off to the drag artist Crystal, a.k.a. Colin Seymour, who appeared on breakfast television the morning after the ruling after getting up at 4am in order to spend hours putting together a note perfect outfit as Elle from Legally Blonde. And he's just talked about the case dressed as Elle from Legally Blonde Looking on breakfast great. television. It is supreme work. It's just amazing. Marsh gave us a screenshot. It's very, <laughs> it's very fabulous. good with yeah, the it's outfit. Just showing real work. All right. On that fantastic outfit note, we're going to close it out. Thanks to Michael Marshall, thanks to Eli Bosnick, and thanks to all the listeners who liked us and followed us on all the various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening, and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, you can send us gifts of money at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like Mediocre Megan, James Roach, Ophir Eyal, Ryan Spazito, Ashley Deloche, Annette Edelman, and David Taylor. We were born... Before the wind, also younger than the sun, ere the bonnie boat was won as we sailed into the mystic. We love you like that. We love you like Van Morrison. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, d d Minus, and Citation Needed, available in all the podcast places. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you are today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. Speaking of polonium murder, <laughs> take a quick break. <laughs> sure, they're gonna or a love word that. from our sponsor, Policy Genius. Really note the time this this episode. Eve. just really get it down to the second for that time spot. <laughs> yeah, gonna get that one just right on the dollar. Speaking of death, works as a segue a lot of the time. It does, yeah. <laughs> Except for Hello Fresh. I'll admit this next story probably isn't news to most of our American listeners, but when we're graced with Michael Marsh's presence, I feel like we owe it to ourselves and each other to give our special guest a sneak peek, if you will, into the American hellscape. I think his name's Michael Marsh. <laughs> is it? Or is it? Marsh, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm not Nicole. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, there you go. Keep going. We're keeping it. We're, keep, we're doing it live. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved.